Hi, welcome back. Welcome to part two of the online lecture um, for week two of communication and media. So I left you with these four the questions or discussion points to consider with regards to this article on President Trump's rhetoric, uh, his style of speech um, and delivery of his presidential communications. So let's go through them one by one. And I'm going to have to do this quite quickly because uh, it's a reasonably short recording and we need to cover a few more points. So let's bang on. All right, so three characteristics of President Trump's communication style. So these are pretty easy to find. They're listed here. So firstly, President Trump has a pretty small working vocabulary. So what that really means is that uh, he doesn't use a lot of words, a lot of different words rather, but seems to use um, a small number of words, but use them over and over again. Um, and the writer in uh, this article has suggested that some research, it's unreliable though, has found that his speeches are pitched at a fourth, fourth grade level, in other words, um, easily understood by the average nine-year-old. So what's that mean? what that means? is that someone who is about nine years old would understand all of the words that are in President's, President Trump's speech. So if you're familiar, for example, of different uh, books that are read by different aged kids as they're growing up, I mean, I've got young kids now, so um, I'm quite familiar with this. Um, so, so, for example, some of the Dr. Seuss books use very, very, very few words. You just use them in different orders uh, to, uh, you know, make the sentences and make the story. Now, uh, we just come. We'll come back to whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, but not necessarily a bad thing. All right, there's nothing wrong with having a small working vocabulary. In fact, it can be quite useful. Number two, second point, is syntax. In other words, the word order and spelling and punctuation are, in this author's uh, consideration a catastrophe. So um, President Trump's not known for um, uh, his attention to detail in his tweets, and especially, um, uh, let alone in his uh, uh, spoken remarks. Um, but again, that may not be uh, entirely a bad thing, and we'll get onto why that might be. Um, this word here, which I'll admit I have. You know, I have trouble remembering if I've ever seen this word before, so I'm not sure if I'm mispronouncing it. And a caluthon or something like that. Anyway, so it's when the syntax is all kind of like muddled up and like it changes halfway through a sentence, uh, um, which President Trump does from time to time. And in fact, everybody does that from time to time, but President Trump does it quite often. And the third point is that the how the um, the expression they've used here is workhorses of his rhetoric. So in other words, is in other words, those um, words or phrases that uh, he uses quite often uh, and uses to add emphasis, to underscore what's important to him, um, to really uh, like draw attention to key points and to add meaning to them. So they're described here as charged but empty, which is a lovely way of, of saying they're they're quite, um, on one hand, you know, energetic words in that they are you know, full of a bit of pop, you know, great, wonderful, amazing, the best, crooked, fake, unfair, failing, all that. So they've got lots of energy, but they suggested here that they're empty and that they don't really add a lot of meaning. Uh, they don't uh, tell you more. They just tell you what President Trump thinks is important. Now, some of the advantages to this style. If we go down here and look at this section of the article, right, one of the advantages is that the, there may be, um, it may be easier for a wider possible, the widest possible audience right, to understand and to relate to. Uh, presidential speech and, and speech by a lot of politicians is often required to be, use this phrase, relatable. In other words, lots of people have to be able to not only understand it, but also feel as though the person who's speaking is using a language that uh, doesn't talk down to them, or maybe doesn't also talk up to them, but is kind of like them. And there's a couple of other examples that are given here. George W. Bush, George W. Bush, who um, who's uh, based in Texas, 
and used to kind of give that kind of like um, Texan drawl and speak quite simply and plainly. Um, similarly, Ronald Reagan, um, the uh, quite um, regarded as quite uh, popular um, president during the 1980s, a Republican president, and he had an earlier career as an actor and was famous for playing like cowboys. So again, a kind of rural, uh, a laconic style, which is, you know, few words and a kind of like folks, folksy style. In other words, you know, not particularly academic or scholarly or, uh, with, without too many rhetorical flourishes or too many over, overly intellectual phrases. Um, Bill Clinton, a democratic president in the nineties, uh, similar approach. Um, he was from the southern states uh, of the United States, so he kind of like adopted a persona from time to time, where he would talk like simple folks from down south. You know, and simple here is not um, used pejoratively or negatively, but uh, it means like plain speaking, you know, ordinary, just normal, someone who is of the people. And they're making the point here that President Obama, Barack Obama. Um, it's, his style was described as sometimes being a showy articulacy. So, uh, President Obama was, you know, he's an accomplished author, best-selling author, um, highly articulate, articulate and passionate orator, a powerful speaker, um, and it came from a kind of like a different rhetorical tradition, uh, definitely not kind of like the right white rural or working class rhetorical traditions that uh, people like um, Trump and Bush have uh, used to their advantage. So in other words, one of the advantages is that people are listening to President Trump and he may from time to time sound like them. In other words, he's speaking to them in words that uh, not only they understand, but you know, they can relate to. Um, the second advantage is that it may be uh, easy to convey not necessarily a lot of information, but a feeling. So uh, it doesn't require a lot of effort from Trump's audiences to understand what President Trump is trying to convey. Right. So he's got a very simple message and often it's a very emotional message. So the way they put it here is you come away from a Trump speech with a feeling, not an argument. So the third item to review for uh, the reading is about these different registers. So one is sounding presidential. And um, if you're wondering what that refers to, you talk about um, sounding presidential or certain um, moments in uh, the life of a president, the career of, of a president. So uh, an acceptance speech, uh, especially the inaugural speeches, um, which are given after the swearing in and those sorts of um, you know, key moments where uh, they are clearly going to be recorded for history and pondered over in the context of uh, other presidents who have come before and who have given similar speeches at the same time. Um, presidential here is obviously related to American politics, but it, we can easily translate that into uh, other political arenas. So when you think about great speakers in um, in uh, British political history, think you know of the speeches of Winston Churchill during uh, World War Two um, in the House of Commons. You know we'll fight them on the beaches, so on. That was um, an example of a speech that you know, American would call that sounding presidential. Uh, um, Statesmanlike is another um, phrase that is sometimes used for that. So the examples of other registers that are included in this article and talk about being able to switch from you know saying something that historic something historic sounding in other words that's a presidential bit then to humanize it with a confidential joke or a, um, a mention of folks so that folksiness um, or a self-teasing personal anecdote All right so and the ability to switch between those two registers so this article suggests and argues has been a facet of uh, some of the most successful presidents in terms of how they've been able to command this switch from one for another from one register to another for great effect. So um, President Obama, um, 
for example, was able to give great keynote speeches, but also um, in some of his other moments, for example, he, at a church service, um, broke into a, a gospel song, which um, I believe is, I don't think a, a president has ever done that before. And he also used to talk about folks back home and those sorts of things. Uh, Ronald Reagan was very, very good at this. Um, Reagan gave some very important, very historic uh, keynote speeches. One of his more famous was when um, he was in Berlin and he said, you know, President Gorbachev, tear down this wall, uh, which is um, a speech meant for the ages, really. It was meant to um, sound around the world and be taken very, very seriously. But then Ronald Reagan, he used to have a wicked sense of humour and he used to just kind of shake his hand. And when he was challenging Jimmy Carter, who was the sitting president, and he just kind of go, like, there you go again. It's just like, you know, it's so dismissive. Um, in a really informal but very powerful way. So that's uh, an example of a different form of register. The last one asks, how does the article compare and contrast equivocation with contradiction? So in this section of the article, you'll see the, the author um, discussing these ideas of equivocation and contradiction. Equivocation um, refers to the ability that a lot of politicians have of equivocating, in other words, uh, saying things that could mean one thing or could mean another, so they can't get tied down on what they're actually meaning. So later on, they can come back and you know take a different, slightly different tack, or uh, change their mind a little bit without you know being forced into admitting that they're contradicting themselves. And so that's described as being a political skill, but a uh, a way that uh, politicians have um, kind of started to really annoy people because it sounds inauthentic and people get kind of sick and tired of hearing politicians be really wishy-washy with their words and not really say what they think or what they, may, what they mean. Now this is compared with Donald Trump who contradicts himself from time to time. Uh, he will say one thing and then he'll say the other. I was against the war in Iraq, I was for the war in Iraq and so on, so on, so on. Now, President Trump seems to get away with this because his supporters, at least, believe that um, he, he, President Trump, that is, believes what he's saying when he's saying it, even when he's contradicting himself. So he uh, has a kind of ring of authenticity about himself because he's not being equivocal, but he's being authentic while at the same time contradicting himself, which is kind of infuriating if you think about it for a while, but it seems to work at least with a uh, a proportion of um, the American voters and certainly amongst President Trump supporters. It certainly makes him quite different from most other president, US presidents that we've had before. Um, so those are those four items that we could, that I've asked you to address for this reading. Uh, and I hope you uh, got something out of that. Just another final thought on this uh, those these four points. This is something that you might reflect upon when you're doing your assignments and how you're going to engage with uh, a an example of communication or media. So in this article, the author is looking at President Trump's speech, uh, looking at quite generally. You could do this looking at just one speech, for example, and it doesn't have to be a politician. It could be uh, a sports person who is giving a you know press interview or something like that. You know, you could do this on. Uh, do a similar analysis of, uh, for example, uh, the cricketers who are caught in the ball tampering scandal or, you know, anything like that. Or it could be award speeches and it doesn't necessarily have to be a speech. That's just one example of it. Just quickly before I move on, um, this type of work that we've just engaged in together here, this type of reviewing, uh, one word for this is, is called discourse analysis. So if you see the phrase discourse analysis come along, um, this is type of the kind of work that um, that refers to. Okay, so I've run out of time for the commentary for the rest of the slides on this video because these aren't, these things only work for 15 minutes. So I'll just do a, a quick additional uh, five minutes um, that I'll put in a third video um, and upload that and you can have a look at that after you've, um, well, when you have, have the time to do so. Okay.